listeners, and welcome to the NK News Podcast. I am your host, Jacko Zwetslut. Today, it is the evening of Monday, the 5th of September, 2022, here in Seoul, and I am joined via Zoom by Sohyun Lee, who is in New York City, the United States, and it's sometime in the morning of Monday, the 5th of September. Before we get started, I'd like to remind all of you, please, to leave a review about this podcast wherever you can. Spotify allows ratings, but not reviews. Apple allows both. Audible allows reviews. And on YouTube, you can like and subscribe us. Secondly, check out nknews.org and consider buying a subscription. Thirdly, follow me on Twitter at JackoZ and nknews at nknews.org. For podcast questions and suggestions and feedback, you can tweet at us or email us at podcast at nknews.org. Okay, my guest today is Sohyun Lee. She describes herself as a North Korea human rights advocate, TEDx speaker, former Kim Il-sung University student, and is now a student at Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. She has a YouTube channel called Pyong Hatton, and you can find her on Twitter, also at Pyong Hatton, which is, of course, a mashup of Pyongyang and Manhattan. Welcome on the show, Sohyun. Hi, Jekka. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, it's my great pleasure. So your hometown, that's in uh, Pyongyang. That's where the Pyong in Pyong Hatton comes from. Uh, and that's you're from true. originally from an elite family in North Korea, aren't you? Well, yes, I was born and grew up in Pyongyang. But like, you know, it's a little um, debatable to call myself is I like from Alice family or not because that is something that named by other people and when I was in North mm. Korea I never realized that I was part of that group so that is something I recently after I made my public activities that I ah. got to know that yeah I was yeah. one of that group so yeah yeah tell us a little bit about your early life and, and background in North Korea Yes. So as I mentioned, I was born in Grand Pyongyang and because because there are no freedom of movement, I rarely had chance to out of Pyongyang. So most of my time was most of my time spent in Pyongyang actually. Mm-hmm. So I went to ele- in elementary school in Pyongyang where the first lady of um, North Korea research attended called Kumsong mm-hmm. Academy. And then I studied at Pyongyang Foreign Language um, School, majored Chinese and English there, and then I continued my Chinese major at Kim Il-sung University between 2008 uh, to early 2010. So at the end of my sophomore year at Kim Il-sung University, I was lucky to be selected as the foreign exchange student. So I went to China to study abroad in 2000. 10 um, and graduate from Dongbei University of, Ch- of Finance and Economics in 2014. So ah, okay. So you, you actually you actually left North Korea before uh, graduating from Kim Il Sung University and and started a, a, a new university in uh, in China and that's the one that you graduated from. Is that correct? Exactly. So I was really a rare case um, that someone who graduated from the foreign university as a North Korean citizen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is very rare. That's right. Uh, Now, why uh, did your whole, uh, you didn't go to China alone. I think your whole family went to China. Did they go because you went to university or did you go to university in China because your family moved to China? Which one came first? So, like, um, the thing came first is that my family was originally dispatched by the government to um, work in China. And Mm -hmm. so that comes first. And then, um, originally, I was a hostage of North Korean regime um, while my parents and my older brother were in China. Because North Korean regime, they couldn't even um, trust the, the elite families. Uh, themselves so they right. always keep one of the family members as a hostage inside of the north korea so uh, and then so you had to stay behind in pyongyang while everybody else went to china exactly and then in you know, uh, end of the 2009 they changed the policy they made a more open policy that they felt that it's going to be really beneficial to the country if they yeah. uh didn't spend any 
single penny and also can allow the um, North Korean students to have the opportunity to study abroad uh, because uh, it's almost 100% sure that they're going to later come back to country mm -hmm. and work for the government. So in uh, in the long run, it's going to be beneficial to the country. So they allow the um, the family members and they allow the um, the like the government officers who mm -hmm. has been dispatched in North Korea, uh, dispatched to the third country. If you could afford the expenses in the third countries, for yeah. your children's tuition and like all those like uh, expenses, then you are allowed to take your uh, children to the third country. But of course, there mm -hmm. are some of those like um, basic standards that like that students has to have um, good academic performance records, and then uh, right. like that students didn't commit any like those uh, crimes or. Uh, violated any rules. Uh, there are those that like, basic rules that apply mm -hmm. to every single uh, student in North Korea. So yeah. once that students meet that those criteria, then the they are most of them are allowed to study abroad at that time. So uh, there are typically two different types of the foreign exchange students. One is um, funded by the government, and uh, the other one is funded by individually, like by family members. So mm -hmm. I was the like second case. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about what your father was doing at, for work in China? So he was the economic officer and his main role was to introduce the uh, investments to North Korea as the like high ranking officer for the regime. So he engaged in the like business Tra tradings uh, between China and North Korea, and also, you know, meet those investors how they can make an investment to North Korea, and then yeah. rebuilding that the collapsed economic system uh, in North Korea. Right. So basically, your father's job, it sounds like uh, his job was to attract investments and to help mm -hmm. make money for the government in North Korea. Yes, so he was not engaging in like managing those like slash funds for the Kim regime. Uh, he was the one more like attracting the money for the uh -huh. country. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, sort of a, a, an investment uh, relations manager or, or something like that. Uh, far, far beyond that kind of role, uh -huh. far beyond that kind of role. But like uh -huh. that was one of his part. Ah, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, now, how was your uh, daily life as a North Korean student studying in a Chinese university? How was that different from your daily life studying at Kim Il Sung University in Pyongyang? Wow, there are lots of differences. First of all, the first thing that I realized that I had more flexibility mm -hmm. when I was studying in China. I mean, I had the opportunities to choose whatever courses I want to take. Mm -hmm. And also I can manage my own schedule and I could um, wear the clothes I wanted. I, I didn't have to wear the uniform all the time. Yeah. And most importantly that I, I mean, didn't have to participate those like mobilizations at school. So when I was uh, studying in Kim il University, I had to go to school in the very early morning because mm -hmm. um, it is uh, obligated to be at the classroom before 7.40 in the morning, yeah. no matter. And then like they don't have any of those elective courses. You just um, take whatever set by the school. So you don't have any freedom at all um, at schooling in North Korea. And of course, we had to wear the uniforms all the time, and they're gonna check your shirts if the shirts like have some like weird prints, and that's gonna mm -hmm. be a big issue. It has to be very plain or just like strips mm. with the stripes, and uh, you cannot wear uh, like weird style of the bags. <laughs> it has yeah. to be like uh, in a like black or like a dark navy color or something mm -hmm. very strict rules applies to every single student and the time what about that i in mm -hmm. in china nevertheless i mean you said you had more freedom and flexibility but did you have to also uh, still attend some kind of uh, organizational life meetings like the study groups and things like that in china 
Of course, of course. <laughs> there is no exception for that. But uh-huh. it is much lesser than um, in North Korea, actually. You only just had to attend the like weekly the self-criticism and then the like ideology um, studying sections just once a week. Uh, yeah. it, mostly like on weekend Sunday morning. So like if when I was in um, the Kim Il-sung University, like it happens almost like on a, every other day. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was much less stressful. Right, right. I can understand that. Now, uh, in your TEDx talk, uh, you uh, told a story about a Chinese taxi driver who burst your North Korean mental bubble uh, and acted like Morpheus in the Matrix by unplugging you from the North Korean system mentally uh, because he asked you why Mm -hmm. Kim Jong-un had not reformed uh, the North Korean economy like Deng Xiaoping had in China. Why do you think this simple question had such an impact on you? So before I received this question from the taxi driver, I didn't really, I never imagined to separate the country and the leadership itself. Mm. because of the education that I received in North Korea, I would say that so that was the brainwashing. Mm-hmm. So in North Korea, I was taught that serving the dictatorship equals to serve the nation. So it always like come along together. And then I, of course, before I get this question, I was aware that only I, I did, didn't completely aware of that. But I was aware that the situation of North Korea, uh, the truth that I believed about my country was not quite true. Mm. Um, so like I was at the stage of kind of suffering from like this dilemma and then trying to figure out like what is true, like what should I believe in or not? And then when I received this question, specifically he separated that the role of the dictatorship that will that gave me a like spark in my brain that yeah and that leads to me that realization of that the reason we are the nation is suffering is because our leader never made up the decision to open the border mm. not because we are incapable not because this like problem comes from its system itself that who has the absolute authority to take any actions is the, the North Korean leader. But our leader, rather to choose to sacrifice the 25 million people of the benefits over on top of his own benefits. So yeah. I would say that question um, means to me a lot because like it um, gave me the like finalization of my all the thoughts, I will say. Mm. Mm-hmm. And at the time when you were studying uh, finance at that university in China, what mm-hmm. actually was your what was your goal uh, or dream? What did you hope to be when you went back to North Korea? My original dream when I um, studied like English and Chinese and my like middle and high school in North Korea, I really wanted to become a, a North Korean woman diplomat. <laughs> And then uh, starting to learn finance in China, I also thought about to being a Korean woman in like banking in North Korea. So does that make sense to you? Yeah. So yeah. So you wanted to uh, to get in, but so you 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 changed your original dream from becoming mm-hmm. a diplomat to moving in the world of banking and finance in North Korea. Yes, because like there are no finance infrastructure at all in North Korea. Uh, and then yes. like uh, North Korea and China, they somewhat share like similar systems, right? Not completely similar, but yep. somewhat. So I wanted to learn about the finance like system uh, from China and then mm-hmm. uh, want to work on that, how we can introduce finance the infrastructure in North Korea. So yes, that's yes. why I pick up the like finance major and then studied the subject there. But I always, I mean, I was really open to the both options mm-hmm. at the time. Yeah, yeah. 
as I understand it, your uh, your family uh, left China and came to South Korea after your best friend at university was taken back to North Korea by force. Now, I know that's a, uh, a painful uh, memory for you, but can you tell us briefly what happened? So back in the end of the 2013, the purge aggressively mm-hmm. started. I mean, it started earlier than 2000, end of the 2013, but it was not aggressive enough that everyone was aware that was going on in this country. But starting from end of the 2013, um, like Kim Jong-un killed his uncle, Zhang song tae and yeah. that was the um, momentum that every North Korean, I will say elite and both non-elite, start to realize that uh, how brutal the regime is. Mm. Mm-hmm. So I lost my best friend in front of my eyes. And it was not only me. Every single family member from my family and from other family members that lost their friends, colleagues, and relatives because of that executions and purge car- mm-hmm. um, carried on between end of 2013 to 2014 just before we left but even if even after we left north korea it continued the hundreds and thousands of people were either executed and were sent to a political prison camp and the only that reason for those like purges were really ridiculous like people mm. who even met the Tang An- kim jong-un's uncle Tang sung tae 10 years mm-hmm. ago were also uh track back for the scenes that that person were close to this um, Kim Jong-un's uncle mm. and then someone who received a medal like 10 years ago from um, like when he when that person worked for Zhang Zhang Tech like 20 years ago he received a medal then this person that became a problem yeah. and then you also had to took the responsibility for that and then th- those reasons are like so unfair Mm -hmm. and unfair to me and i couldn't really understand because at least those people around me who uh who either was executed or sent to a political prison camp they were like the most naive and good people Mm -hmm. i have seen they are really loyal to the regime and then in in the case of your your friend, do you think mm-hmm. she was taken back to North Korea because she was a family member of somebody who uh, now was deemed to be an enemy of Kim Jong-un? Yes. So that was really shocked me and then um, frustrating me that even if, I don't know if um, her father really committed any crimes or not, mm-hmm. because there was no like um, any process made for him um like there was n- no lawyers defend for him and there is no any of those um trial happened so yeah. we we had no option like we had to believe that what the government says but mm. the thing that i couldn't really understand was that even if her father committed any crimes why like innocent person of his family members yeah. Uh, had to be punished together. I mean, we are living in the 21st century, and then this such like guilt by association and killing the third g- uh, generations of the family members, that is something that happened like long time in the past of the Korea history. Mm. No, that, that, that's true. Yeah. And so that's, and, and that was the uh, the catalyst, I suppose, that purge of Jung Song Tech and his allies and connections. That was what made your family make the choice that we have to get out of here. We can't stay in China. We can't go back to North Korea. Is that correct? Uh, yes and no. That was the part of the reason. Um, so, um, like, observing the, like, huge scale of courage, uh, people, not only us, all the people realized that there are no safe zone at all in this country. Yeah. Like, anyone could be the next target in this regime, no matter, mm. like, uh, you committed a crime or not and so Mm -hmm. we feel the threaten and then we like we feel we observed injustice 
but there are nothing we could do as an earthquake citizen because of their like severe surveillance carried on for the it's public even no even if we uh, even if we, the ones who are out of, outside of the country so we wanted to do something like save our lives and mm, then also yeah. wanted to save our loved ones but there are nothing much we could do so we made the best choice we could do so that was the leaving the country was it practically difficult to get on a plane and leave china with north korean passports mm, it it could be but for us uh was it was not that difficult mm -hmm. i mean there are a few countries that uh, people can visit with the north korean passport first of all but mm. It was not that practically difficult for us to get a ticket and travel to third countries. But mm. I will say the most people, um, most North Korean, those people who had the passport didn't really try because they are afraid of the consequences followed after mm -hmm. they came back um, yeah. after they visiting the like different countries. So right. I wish I had more opportunity to test this out but yeah the that was the only and the last time i tested with the mm -hmm. north korean passport but uh, from my experience it was not that difficult maybe we picked a like really um easy country that mm -hmm. we can travel with the north korean passport yeah now uh, after leaving china you and your family lived in south korea for a year before moving to the United States. Why did you move there? I mean, I really have a good memory about the South Korean people and the life experience in South Korea. But the only and the major reason that we had to remove again to the United States uh, was because of the security reasons. And there were many North Korean spies in North in South Korea and mm -hmm. uh, from my understanding and we personally knew that there are some North Korean agents that were living in China and waiting to be dispatched to South Korea as a spy so and we also later got to learn that there are also many North Korean followers mm -hmm. so our phones are tapped and computers are um, like hacked. Uh, there are certain mm. threats that we physically feel felt uh, while I was in South Korea and North Korean regime had my grandma and aunt mm. on the Uri Minjokiri website and urged oh. us to come back. And yeah. um, I mean, we didn't need any like public activities while we was in South Korea. But mm -hmm. they found out that we are in South Korea because before it was like mysterious for the North Korean government that where we went to, it was yeah. like a confidential for the security of my family members left behind North Korea. But the regime found out and then that was a like huge signal to us that mm -hmm. uh, it, it is not safe in South Korea. And not only for our security, but uh, for the security uh, of my family members in North Korea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that um, some uh, North Korean defectors who come to South Korea for one reason or another, maybe mm -hmm. because they're dissatisfied with life in South Korea or because they feel a security threat in South Korea, they want to move on to a third country, but they find that difficult because mm -hmm. most countries do not accept what they call a double defection. That is, if you mm -hmm. have defected to South Korea and have been accepted in South Korea, you don't automatically have the right to apply to refugee status in a third country. Uh, was mm -hmm. that difficult in, in your case to, to make that move to the US? Um, it is. It has not been changed. And I wish that um, America government be more aware of that situation in South Korea, the situation mm. of North Korean defectors in South Korea. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, there should be a really, really good uh, reason for, mm. yeah, apply for the like refugee status. Right, like some mm. kind of uh, physical threat or mm -hmm. uh, or, or mm -hmm. some sort of uh, yeah real danger to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
exactly. Now, as you said, when you were living in South Korea, you did not, uh, you and your family did not do any public activities. Uh, mm -hmm. When did you decide to become a public activist against the government of North Korea? Um, it was between 2019 and 2020. I, so I was only like volunteering for these um, North Korean human rights issues and other um, issues related like denuclearization and information dissemination um, behind. And then like that was the time when there were really like many uh, events was going on between the North Korea and South Korea, North Korea and the US. There yeah. are three times of the like US and North Korea summits and like countless summits, um, official and unofficial summits between South Korea and North Korea, but none of them really care about the violations of, of happening in North Korea. I mean, mm. I was so disappointed about that because I personally strongly believe that human rights is the key in serving all those complicated issues around North Korea. And I mean, I know South, uh, the former president of South Korea was the human rights lawyer. They fought so hard for their democracy and human rights mm -hmm. back in the 70s, 80s. But why they are choose to silent for the human rights violations happening in North Korea. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't understand from mm -hmm. like my logic. Yeah. Um, uh, I realized that how important it is that our North Korean detectors add our voice, raise up our voices and add our um, experience and the reality mm -hmm. of North Korea situation uh, in public. So now that you, you've chosen to uh, to be a public activist, um, what mm -hmm. do you hope to achieve? My ultimate goal uh, is going to be free North Korean people from the dictatorship repression. And I want to achieve that people in North Korea live in a better quality of life so that they don't need to worry about every single meal every day. Mm -hmm. And then than suffer from the human rights violations anymore. I just want to, I just hope that they enjoy the universal values of human rights and uh, mm. just better quality of life, better lives. Yeah. And I believe they are deserve it. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about your YouTube channel, Pyong Hatton. Why did you choose that name? Yes. So um, Pyong, the, like it is combination of Pyongyang and Manhattan. I mean, Pyongyang, of course, it tells my identity, um, mm. where I'm from. And then it is a capital city of North Korea. Mm -hmm. And when I think of the like symbol of freedom, the first city that came across my mind was Manhattan. Mm. Uh, there is a Statue of Liberty in Manhattan. And my approach to name this Manhattan was very simple. I want to bring the liberty in. Pyongyang, and once we liberate Pyongyang, there is more chance we can liberate uh, the entire North Korea because that's where the Kim dictator reason, have the reason in. Yeah. Now, I, I noticed looking at your YouTube channel that it looks like you stopped making videos about five months ago. Um, until then, what kind of content were you trying to produce for that channel? So, um, my channel is focused on the uncensored truth about North Korea, especially the truth about Pyongyang and then the system. Mm -hmm. So that is the place where we were born and grew up. So, and I want, I, we've been trying to introduce that our experience and analysis from the like millennial uh, perspectives and um and who lived under the world's most totalitarian state but at the same time experienced democracy like somewhat to somewhat extent in china and south korea and now we are going to ask more our uh, experience in the united states yeah why did you stop making videos i mean so many people have like um curiosity about that but the thing is that I mean, I have my major job yeah. and 
Um, so my major job still related with North Korean issues like information disseminations. So mm -hmm. I wish I'm a like full time YouTuber. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But right. there are so many things that we need to do and we have also there are lots of other voices uh, in english there mm -hmm. so um unless we feel that there should be more comprehensive like understanding about a situation and uh, certain like subjects mm -hmm. um most of t my time i'm focusing on like other my major job mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems that at the moment that most North Korean people inside North Korea, they are not pushing for change in their system. Uh, and that suggests that maybe they are satisfied with their government, or at least they are not dissatisfied enough to want to protest or change things or leave North Korea. Why do you think that is? I mean, they couldn't. They couldn't push the change instead of North Korea. And then I, I know like there are many people that are thinking that um, the reason that the North Korean did not, has not collapsed yet because uh, the North Korean elites uh, stood aside with the dictator and then kept their system. But I will say that is not the case. The reason that North Korea has not collapsed since the uh, 1990s is not because the system is superior than any other systems or the like dictator has a like great leadership i mean they the north korean dictator rules the country with fear mm. and he kill he kept threatens people and scrutinize the like people so that was the main reason and you can simply think of that the whole nation as a like concentration camp and i believe that's gonna be much easier to understand why there is no any the changes in north korea and then i know that there are many scholars arguing about this and then i would say those like small percentage of the elite among the north north korean population are also slaves to the dictator um mm. yeah so they are not um i mean they don't know when they are gonna killed next day everything is up to the dictatorship mm -hmm. and uh people think that north korean elites they um, are loyal to the regime but they are not they are forced to be loyal to the regime uh, otherwise they're gonna be killed not only themselves but like entire family is gonna be killed my father for example uh he received the tvs and the like watches from the dictators mm -hmm. but because we are human beings we want farther than what we are given and that is not enough to fulfill that human's self-interest and that is not enough to enough for North Korean people to make survives um, basic, uh, most importantly. So the, uh, it is really the like correction, it is a big issue among the elites, but we have to keep in mind that what made them such like corrupted. And it is the system, it is the um, North Korean dictator. So, you know, sum up, I will, I will say, it can be said that the government, the North Korean dictator, can be can maintain his own um, kingdom is because of the rule of fear and the policy of isolation. If the North Korean people are not ready or are too afraid mm -hmm. to change their system from within, mm -hmm. do you think that it's appropriate that activists and defectors who are safely outside the system try to uh, encourage them to push for change? It is not only appropriate, it is essential. I mean, there is no change. It is not because there is, um, I mean, there is no like enough power within it because there is um, no enough information to uh, like raise awareness of their situations and enlighten them. 
So mm-hmm. I strongly believe that it is essential um, to spread the uh, narrations of what North Korean people think and what they want to the international community uh, by s- and then also um, sending information um, inside of North Korea to let them be aware that uh, what kind of situation they are in and what they should do in order to um, to live a desirable life that they want. Mm-hmm. Now, in the Korean immigrant community in the United States, there are uh, many different groups who mm-hmm. are interested uh, in North Korea, but not all of them agree with your approach or your uh, public statements about life in North Korea. Some groups want to make peace with the North Korean government. They call upon the U.S. troops to withdraw from the Korean Peninsula so that the two mm-hmm. Koreas can make peace among themselves. What do you think about this approach? I mean, we shouldn't approach the North Korean regime as a general state. We already know that it is not a normal country. And the reason that I'm going I'm going against that the peace agreement uh, with North Korean regime is that because it is not a peace agreement with the people. If there are if their approach is talking to North Korean Publics and then standing for the benefits of the the general public. There is no reason for me to object it, but eventually, that is only uh, helping the North Korean dictator to maintain his power and his kingdom, and which means that we are take off the uh, possibilities for the North Korean general people to be free from the slavery by the dictator. So that's the only reason I will say, yeah, I am going against the like peace uh, with the dictatorship of North Korea currently. Mm, I understand. Uh, now, you are not the first North Korean defector woman to give a TED talk or to start a YouTube channel in English or even to study at Columbia University. Uh, now, I remember 20 years ago when I was started to read about North Korea, there were really not many North Korean defectors who mm-hmm. could speak about North Korea in English. And and now there are a few. There is, uh, for example, Hyun So Lee, who was mm-hmm. a guest on an earlier iteration of this podcast with my friend Kurt Ashen years ago. And there's uh, Yonmi Park, who mm-hmm. I interviewed last year and who has her own YouTube channel and used to study at Columbia. And now there is you. And I, I just wonder how... How do you sit you sorry how do you situate yourself among these peers so for example are your messages or missions different or are your politics and approaches similar so where are you in that spectrum well first of all um they are all cre- incredible people and as a person from the same place I'm really proud of them and I believe there should be more voices from North Korea in English in this international society and then i believe like we everyone has different role in this issue because we have different experience and we all have different approaches but what i strongly believe is that our goal is same no matter what kind of different approaches we take um our ultimate goal um to free north korean people are same so my and I, I would define my role is to giving more comprehensive understanding of North Korea and also at the same time by raising the voices of the situation. Um, I want to get the most efficient and productive approach in the issue so that we can accelerate the time um, and the bright future for the North Korean people. And I don't think I, I truly believe that this is my privilege to serve for my community as a person mm. who had the rare chance to escape North Korea. And then I don't believe that my role is going to be ended um, as the country became free, but I believe I have more roles to commit after the like post Kim world. I will say the like, Kim free world. Yeah. in North Korea. Uh, we want them to be free because we want North Korean people 
live in a better society, right? If mm -hmm. like after like the camp free world, there is nothing changed and people start uh, still start still suffer from the starvation and uh, like live in a miserable situation. It is kind of pointless that we are fighting against the Kim dictators now. So I really want to work on build a prosperity country, mm. like using my knowledge, mm. experience in America and with American people in the future. Are you familiar with the social media channels that North Korea now uses to get its message out to the world in different languages like Chinese, mm -hmm. Russian and English. Have you seen some of these YouTube channels? Yes, I did. Uh, the most recent North mm -hmm. Korean vlogger is a young girl about nine years old named so sorry, 11 years old, I think, named mm -hmm. Songa, who mm -hmm. speaks English with an upper class English accent and who now lives back in Pyongyang. Have you seen any of her films? Uh, I only um so the clips of it from the news media mm -hmm. what do you think of of the work that uh, is going on there to give a positive message about north korea through social media the first thing i feel really really sad about the girl mm. um she has been using as a propaganda tool for the north korean regime and i believe she doesn't know where what she's doing because if I were at her age, I would not know what's going on and what I'm doing. Like, I'm yeah. just like doing what I asked for to do, mm -hmm. um, like memorizing the scripted, you know, scripted messages and just say it in front of the film, um, the like cameras. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it's so sad that, and I'm so angry that North Korean regime now even start to use the, use the young children to propagate the regime. I mean, it, it is not the first time, but mm. um, it still hurts me a lot. What do you predict for, for her future, for young Songa? Do you think she might wake up one day like you mm -hmm. did because of something that she read or heard or something that, that somebody said? and she might feel that things are going wrong in her country? If there is no chance for her to um, come out of the country and experience the foreign country again in the future, or um, she receive like appropriate contents to, uh, which can tell her the problem of the regime, the system, then there is really rare chance for her to mm. get some enlightenment. I would say because the like that is, it is really the, the North Korean government is really tightly controls its people and continuously brainwashing people and uh, it is not that easy for North Korean people as we assume here that um, easy to be out of that their bubble. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your future now. Uh, you started a GoFundMe fundraising campaign because. You're going to start studying at Columbia University this month. Tell us about that. What are you going to study and why? So I'm going to study international finance and economic policy at Columbia CIPA. It is under the Masters in International Affairs program. But the reason I specifically pick up this course, uh, this concentration is because I wanted to continue my dream that I hold uh, when I was in China as a North Korean citizen. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there is nowhere else a like perfect place I can learn about this economic and finance policy than in America, especially at Columbia CIPA. We are located in the like perfect combination of the economic and political power. So uh, yeah. as I mentioned earlier that I see my role is not only committing to Kim free world, but also bringing a like prosperity country for the North Korean people. So uh, I want to get prepared for that day. Ah, to, to make North Korea a prosperous country. Exactly. And I believe mm. that we have that potential. We are North Korean nations are talented people and they work hard and they are smart. And if you are given that opportunity, I believe the like next era 
in the future, the East Asia country, East Asia is going to be dominated by the Korean people. <laughs> Wow. Okay. That's a big dream. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I'm a little ambitious, but I think dream doesn't cost any money. So why don't I just mm -hmm. dream big and aim high? Dream big. Yeah. 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 Now, um, as we said earlier, you were originally um, a member of an elite family from Pyongyang and your father uh, was a businessman. You were allowed to live in China with your family. Now you live in New York City, which is not a cheap place to live. Uh, so why do you need help from other people to study at Columbia University? No, at all. It is really, uh, it is really, the tuitions are really expensive. Uh, I mean, the reason I need um, support, financial support from other people, because that mm -hmm. um, I wish that I had more time to prepare for the graduate school earlier, mm. but once I made up my decision, I just uh, moved on for my next step. And then that was the another reason. But, um, and there are some arguments that among the people, then if you don't have money, then why you end up choose at the, like the most expensive university? I mean, but the reason is that it, it's not, I mean, having a degree from the prominent school is uh, going to be a mm. good thing for me. But um, the most important thing that I, the most important reason to me that I choose, I chose a Columbia CIPA is because I want to give a hope not only to North Korean dict dict uh, defectors, but also to North Korean citizens. So people are somewhat curious and envy of the life in the freedom world, but they are afraid, especially the LS people. They want to take that risk and um, move on to the journey in search of the freedom world. But they are at the same time very afraid that what if their life end up worse than uh, what they have as a North Korean citizen. Mm. And I want to show them that as long as you work hard, study hard, you're gonna be given more opportunities in this freedom world. And there are gonna be plenty of communities that's gonna support you to pursue your dream and then be succeed in this world. So yes, I mean, I, and there, there, uh, there is another reason is that, I mean, Colombia CIPA is really well known for not giving much scholarships to the, their master program students. Yeah, second to the Georgetown MSFS program. So yeah, I was unfortunate to get the fellowship or scholarship from Colombia CIPA, but I'm gonna working on the fellowship from the like next year, the second year, but uh, for the first uh, year, I need some like support from people. Yeah. yeah. Now you have received one uh, notable big donation mm -hmm. from an unusual source. That is the the family of the late Otto Warmbier has pledged fifteen thousand dollars to you. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, listeners to this podcast and people who are familiar with North Korea will know that the Warmbier family has a, a painful history mm -hmm. uh, with North Korea. Uh, it must feel unusual to you to receive a, a, that scholarship fund from the family of a young man who unfortunately died after traveling to your hometown as a tourist. Absolutely. I mean, I'm truly grateful for Otto Warmbier's family for this honorable scholarship. And I believe this is not only give the North Korean people a hope, but at the same time, sending a message to the North Korean dictator that you are going to be charged for your sins, no matter, like, no matter when and how mm -hmm. it's going to take. Have you had a chance to meet the Warmbier family in person? Yes. Um, I was so lucky to meet them once in DC at the HINK Gala last year. And, and mm -hmm. I, I feel really sorrow for their loss, and then yeah. very sorry about that because of North Korea, they lost their loved ones. And mm. at the beginning, I really want to engage in the conversation with them, but I didn't know what to say to them because mm -hmm. I feel really, really sorry about their loss. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, I didn't engage in any like uh, results of that, but the fact that I'm from North Korea, I feel guilty at the mm -hmm. beginning. 
and that's the exact uh, feeling that my entire family feel about. Um, mm. So we had real, a very natural conversation, and then right after I got to the Columbia, we, we also had the conversation of the phone, and then mm. um, Mr. and Mrs. Wombiers they made up their big decision to support my education, uh, even if yeah. like they are not fully. Mm, supportive where I'm studying at, <laughs> but I truly appreciate it. Yeah, now th there's some irony, uh, mm -hmm. there's a bit of background information for our listeners here. The uh, the, the Warmbier um, parents uh, sued the North Korean government in the United States mm -hmm. and uh, were uh, given a settlement by the court. And so some of the money that they received was. Uh, uh, appropriated from the uh, the North Korean government, um, uh, selling a, a ship and emptying out a bank account. So there's some irony that um, the Warmbiers have received money as part of this legal settlement from the mm -hmm. North Korean government, mm -hmm. and they've given some of that money to you to fund your study. So now it, it's almost like uh, your studies are being <laughs> funded by the North <laughs> Korean government in some weird, weird, twisted way. Uh, and and now they're, they they talked about I, I we actually had an interview with them at NK News mm -hmm. earlier this week and um, or a story about them I should say uh, and in the story they were quoted as saying that they're considering giving scholarships to other North Korean defectors in the future to turn a negative experience uh, into a positive one and and what do you think about that how do you respond to that It's extremely meaningful to us. Mm and to the whole nation, I would say. Because if we study with the Kim Jong-un's money and use our forces and knowledges fighting against the regime, that's going to be really, really impactful. Uh, mm. Not only for the dictatorship, but yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't see any like best scenario than this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it does sound like uh, something that's very meaningful, and it is. Uh, mm -hmm. It's great for the warm beers to try to turn their uh, terrible loss and negative experience into something positive. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a, uh, a very very commendable uh, attitude. Uh, how can people find your GoFundMe page, and how can they help you, Sohyun? Um, so people can find me on GoFundMe page that um, from North Korea to the Ivy League. If they type my name, I believe it's going to pop up on the screen. So I am humbly ask any of you like small amount of donation or even you know, like sharing it with your like community. That's going to be really mm -hmm. a big help for me. And then I need to update it since I have received some scholarships from um, Otto Lombier's foundation and then Bush Foundation. Yeah. But I still, oh, need, yeah, I still need some support. So I, I mean, I truly hope that that the support I received from people one day can towards to other people so we can uh, educate and build up more those community forests fighting against the dictatorship and freeing North Korean people for the better future of North Korea. Thank you. And we will definitely put a, uh, a link to your uh, GoFundMe page as well as your uh, Twitter account on the show notes for this episode. So uh, listeners, if you're uh, wondering how to get to that, you can uh, find that uh, on the show notes at nknews.org. Uh, so go and check it out there. I want to thank you once again, Sohyun Lee, for coming on the uh, the podcast today. You've been very generous with your time. I really appreciate it. No, thank you so much for having me again, Jaku. And then like, I'm so I'm um, grateful that you are so advertising my GoFundMe page on your podcast. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. It's the least we can do. By the way, do you have uh, do you have any plan to write a book mm -hmm. in the future? Or do you, are you already writing a book? Well, actually, I have a plan. And I am planning that, planning to publish it as right after um, graduating Columbia CIPA. Uh, I ah. I just started, like you know, not officially, just started by myself, mm -hmm. like uh, writing some of my memories and my experience in North Korea uh, here and there, like different times that, but yeah, I'm working on it. And then that's going to be my next uh, plan. Yeah, published my own book. 
Excellent. Well, <laughs> I, I wish you all the best with that. And I look forward to uh, to reading your book when it comes out. Thank you so much. I wish you, yeah, find me again when the book is published. <laughs> Indeed, we probably will. Yes, thank you very much once again, Sohyun Lee, for coming on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Sohyun Lee. If you already have an NK News subscription, please take a look at our NK Pro platform, which offers unparalleled services specifically catered to the needs of professionals who monitor developments on the Korean Peninsula. You can inquire about access and a free trial membership by writing an email to membership at nknews.org today. Also, if you have any feedback or questions or guest recommendations, please send them by email to podcast at nknews.org. Our thanks, as always, go to Arius Dare and Brian Betts for facilitating this episode and to Gabby Magnuson, our post-recording producer genius. Thank you very much and listen again next time.